Good afternoon, and welcome to the second edition of our Better Health Outcomes Speaker Series. I'm Adriana Simon, and I'm the Program Manager of Tobacco-Free Adagio Health in Allegheny County. I'm also a person who is passionate about public health, systemic health and racial disparities as seen in communities of color and those vulnerable populations. This month, Adagio Health is celebrating 50 years of providing health and wellness services, including medical care, nutrition, and education in Western Pennsylvania. Now we're in West Virginia and New York as well. Women's health is a primary focus for our organization, and we are continually working to align our services with the needs of vulnerable populations. This week is National Black Maternal Health Week. It is a week that was founded by Black Mamas Matter Alliance, and it represents an opportunity to raise awareness, inspire activism, and strengthen organizing efforts around Black maternal health. For too long, Black women in the United States have faced dire maternal health disparities. Black women regularly experience poor maternal health outcomes, including disproportionately high rates of death related to pregnancy and childbirth. And those numbers are without considering the impact that education and socioeconomic status play in that disproportion. With all of that in mind, our focus today is Black maternal health crisis in the United States. And we have two remarkable speakers joining us today, Dr. Dara Mendez and Pennsylvania Representative Morgan Cephas. First, we are going to hear from Dr. Dara Mendez. Dr. Dara Mendez is, is an assistant professor at, of epidemiology and interim director at the Center of Health Equity at the University of Pittsburgh, where her research, teaching, curriculum development, and service applies equity, anti-racism, anti-oppression praxis, as well as black feminist theory, critical race theory, and public health critical race praxis. Dr. Mendez's research program focuses, focuses on understanding and addressing racial and socioeconomic inequity in pregnancy, birth, and women's health. She employs novel methods to measure and understand how racism, including institutional and structural racism and social contexts intersect to contribute to inequities in health. She works closely with community-based and governmental agencies to address inequity in maternal and infant health, serving on the infant mortality Collaborative for Allegheny County, serving on the Pennsylvania Maternal Mortality Review Committee, the Birth Equity Strategies Together or Best Allegheny Initiative, and the Black Equity Coalition. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dara Mendez. Dr. Dara Mendez, we are so excited to have you here. We want to welcome you, and we want to know that the floor is yours to share what's on your, on your mind today. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, thank you for the welcome um, and just the opportunity from Adagio Health um, to share with you all, with the larger community about Black maternal health. So I'm gonna share some slides um, today. So as Adriana said, Black Maternal Health Week, we are in Black Maternal Health Week founded by Black Mamas Matter Alliance. Um, they are an organization that has been advocating for Black moms and birthing people and Black communities and have been um, leading the charge and the work around Black Maternal Health Week for over four years. They are currently also advocating for UN, for the United Nations to recognize April 11th as the International Day for Maternal Health and Rights. I also want to uplift and name several organizations here locally in Pittsburgh and across Pennsylvania who have been engaged in work in reproductive justice, Black Maternal Health, and specifically Black Maternal Health Week. Um, that includes Healthy Start, New Voices for Reproductive Justice, Pittsburgh Brown Mamas, the Black Women's Policy Agenda, um, and if you don't already know about these organizations, please learn about them, support their work. So first I wanted to start my presentation with some key metrics and data related to maternal health, briefly discuss the impact of racism and oppression, um, including some examples from my own research, 
and then end with a few other key points about next steps in addressing Black maternal health. So this um, shows a figure of maternal mortality, and it's often used as an international indicator of health of the population overall, very similar to how infant mortality is also used as an indicator of health for a population or society. Um, and this figure shows the US, United States, compared to several other developed nations. And we have the highest maternal mortality ratio, and that's defined as a person um, while pregnant within 42 days of childbirth or termination of pregnancy. With the most recent report from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention that was released last year, there was a slight uptick from 17.4 to 20.1 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. Um, and from trend data um, that looks at maternal mortality between 1990 and 2013, um, one study from The Lancet found on average that developed nations saw a 3.1% annual decline in maternal mortality while the United States actually saw an increase of about 1.7% over that time period. Within the United States, there is variability across the, um, the states. This is also maternal deaths here on this um, first map, um, which is per 100,000 live births based on data from 2005 to 2014. And we see several Southern states having the highest rate as well as several states in the Northwest and East. Um, the box to the right in red is a snapshot of data from 2008. This does not include data from all states in this recent report from um, 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 the CDC. Um, I would imagine because of small sample size or small number of deaths with on the state level for one particular year, but we see Arkansas with the highest at 14.9 and Pennsylvania here our state at 14.0 um, maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. Um, if we were to look at the snapshot once again, in 2019, there were 754 women who were identified as having died of maternal causes in the United States, compared to the 658 in 2018. So once again, that's showing this increase over time. There are also persistent racial inequities in maternal mortality. And as Adriana said, Black women are more than twice as likely to die from pregnancy-related um, um, uh, uh, issues compared to white women. And this graphic here is um, US data across the entire United States <clears throat> for 2019 with a rate of 44 for black women showing the highest risk. This is a similar disparity, but pregnancy related deaths. So this is occurring within the first year um, with black women being three times as likely to, to die compared to um, white women. Um, and we also see a disparity among American Indian and Alaskan Native women. Um, data collected by the CDC among 14 maternal mortality review committees across the country found that more than 60% of these deaths were deemed preventable. So the majority of these deaths are, are preventable. Um, and here in the state of um, Pennsylvania, there are also persistent racial disparities in mortality and pregnancy-related deaths. I personally serve on the PA Maternal Mortality Review Committee, and we're actively reviewing cases beginning with the year of 2018. And we have not finished that review or provided specific outcomes and recommendations as, as of yet. However, the Pennsylvania Department of Health published a report in late 2020 of pregnancy-associated deaths based on data, um, death, um, death rate of data only from 2013 to 2018. Some of the highlights from that report was that there was an increasing trend in maternal deaths with non-Hispanic Black women accounting for 23% of pregnancy-associated deaths, while they only accounted for 14% of Pennsylvania um, births during that time. And then also based on additional data found on the Pennsylvania Department of Health statistics website, only based on death certificates, um, we find that there's 19.7 deaths per 100,000 um, live births for Black women versus nine per 100,000 for white women. So that is, once again, a twofold um, difference in the state of Pennsylvania. These racial inequities and maternal deaths are not adequately explained by individual risk factors, such as smoking behaviors or other related lifestyle factors, income, or even education. <clears throat> and so, this graph shows pregnancy-related deaths by race and education across the U.S. Here we see that Black birthing people are more likely to die regardless of education. And among those with a college degree or higher, the racial disparity widens. So we see it's five times 
among that category. We also see that Black women with a college degree are more likely to experience a pregnancy-related death than a white woman with less than a high school education. <clears throat> and for every one maternal death, there are thousands who experience other complications or morbidity, such as a trajectory of chronic illness after pregnancy, and hundreds who experience severe morbidity. And this includes life-threatening outcomes such as stroke, cardiac events, or eclampsia. Um, this graph here shows severe maternal morbidity by race, and it compares 2006 to 2015 data. And we see an overall increase for all racial and ethnic groups and a persistent racial disparity where Black birthing people are more likely to experience severe maternal morbidity compared to all other groups. These racial inequities are not a result of a genetic difference or some underlying biological characteristic that differs between racial groups. Um, and this also means shifting away from the individual blame narratives that are very germane um, to our field and addressing the larger systems and structures that create these inequities. Um, and these racial inequities in maternal health are a result of a long history of oppression and structural racism that shapes life opportunities, experiences, and ultimately health. I like to show this timeline because it gives a little bit of a historical context, right, in our understanding of maternal health inequities today. That our current context is connected to legally sanctioned forms of racial oppression and many examples in this timeline. This includes our specific his history in medicine and healthcare and scientific racism. Many are familiar with Tuskegee, but also sterilization and eugenic programs to eliminate Black people's ability to have children development of procedures and tools that we use today in obstetrics and gynecology by J. Marion Sims, who's been touted as the God, um, sort of, if you will, godfather of, of obstetrics and gynecology, and other um, physicians who experimented on Black people um, and women in particular in the, in the area of maternal health. Um, one text that I recommend is Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington that really talks about this. And then outside of medicine and science, we have le legally sanctioned prohibit prohibition of education, residential segregation and redlining, which I'll talk a bit about later, but policies and practices that limited home ownership or wealth attainment through property and land. This long history of oppression and racism puts into context that what we see today with respect to maternal health. Many may be familiar with the Lost Mother series, which tells the stories of pregnant and birthing people who died due to pregnancy. The top picture to the right is Shalon Irving, who was a colleague and fellow postdoctoral scholar with me through the Caleb Health Scholars Program. We were in the same cohort. She was a CDC officer, a public health expert. She specialized in health equity and maternal child health. And she died shortly after childbirth due to complications from high blood pressure. Serena Williams also is an example of someone that despite knowledge of her own body as an athlete was dismissed and described almost dying as a result of childbirth. And there are countless examples of black women whose pain, symptoms, or even basic desire for care is dismissed and regard, disregarded. Um, Erica Garner, many um, are familiar as well, the, the daughter of Eric Garner, who was an advocate around police violence, also died not long after childbirth. And this speaks to the cultural and structural racism that exists not just in medical care, but in the everyday lives of Black people in the United States. And when speaking about the everyday lives of Black people in the US, we have to talk about what was considered the year of the twin pandemics of 2020. This was a state sanctioned racial violence, a police violence of black, against Black communities, as well as COVID-19. The deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd at the hands of police are examples of the lives senselessly taken, but also the collective trauma that Black people experience in the United States as a result. George Floyd called out for his mother prior to his last breaths. And his call, as this picture shows, summoned all mothers, mothers from communities where we are more likely to be killed by police, more likely to receive harsher sentencing, experience imprisonment, and a number of other inequities. We saw a global movement for Black lives in 2020, calling attention to racism in the treatment of Black people in America and across the globe, but also during a time of a pandemic that has wrecked havoc on Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. Black communities, for example, were more likely to be exposed to COVID-19, are overrepresented in cases, hospitalizations, deaths, and now we see inequities in vaccine distribution and rates. 
So not only was COVID-19 the tip of the iceberg in terms of existing inequities, we expect that it will exacerbate the inequities, um, including in maternal um, health. This shows um, confirmed cases of COVID-19 via laboratory assessment among pregnancy um, or, or around birth, sorry, pregnant people by race and ethnicity in the United States. So this is data from January 2020, um, 2020 to more recent a few days ago. Um, and this is out of data where race and ethnicity was available. Over 9,000 non-Hispanic Black women had COVID during pregnancy, which represents 13% of the overall cases. This is slightly less in the representation of about 15% of all U.S. births. Um, however, Hispanic women represent a majority of the cases and are overrepresented with 43% of the cases while only being 24% of the population. And white women represent over 50% of U.S. births but represent only 30% of COVID cases. Now, there are some limitations with this data as this does not re represent all pregnancies in the U.S., um, but COVID data is updated weekly by the CDC to fill in missing information and, and improve um, the data metrics available. This past year, we also saw a number of cities and municipalities name racism as a public health crisis. This is a map actually from the American Public Health Association, which lays out all municipalities um, and states that have adopted some form of a legislation or declaration. Um, and some of this was a result of the movement for Black Lives and the national conversation around racism, police violence, and the twin pandemic. A number of declarations were made, um, over 190 to date, name racism as a public health crisis. And although naming racism is important, only several of these um, declarations and pieces of legislation specifically detail how they will address racism. So in Pittsburgh, I had the opportunity to testify back in December 2019 when our city legislation um, put forth um, three declarations around racism as a public health crisis. I spoke to the effects of racism on health, but that any legislation moving forward should also take an intersectional approach that highlights specific ways in which gender racism affects Black women in this city um, of Pittsburgh, and that the city should have full transparency and accountability measures related to any legislation. And with respect to the policies across the US, my team also did a very brief um, review of states that had the most recent anti-LGBTQ healthcare bills. And these were bills excluding healthcare for transgender youth. And what we saw in our just brief review is that several states such as Alabama, Kansas, Mississippi, and South Carolina had these anti-LGBTQ bills, but no known legislation related to racism as a public health crisis. This year in particular, CDC recently declared racism as a public health threat, which is important. Um, but CDC stands on the shoulders of many people over the past several decades who have already been doing um, an, um, the work around naming racism and addressing racism, including gendered racism as critical in understanding and um, addressing racial inequities. One of these people is Dr. Kamara Jones. Many of you may know of her. She was a former head of the American Public Health Association. Um, also former um, employee of the Center for D Disease Con Control and Prevention, um, and a, just a nationally known expert as it relates to racism and health. Um, and one of the things that this work talks about her work and many others, um, that race is not the risk factor, but racism is. And we talk about risk factors for health. Um, and, and she also lays out her framework for the levels of racism. So I'll talk a little bit about institutionalized and person mediated, also known as interpersonal racism and some of my work related to this. David Williams and others argue that residential segregation is core form of institutional racism, that it shapes health. And in my work in particular, I look at how residential redlining has shaped both historical and contemporary forms of wealth attainment through home ownership, but also subsequent investment in um, communities. And this is a graphic, a color coded map of Pittsburgh. There's also one of Philadelphia and many others across the United States. They actually have been digitized um, in the mapping inequality project. Um, but this is the Homeowners Loan Corporation map for 1937. It's a residential security map and it's an example um, of a quote unquote redlining map. And the areas with African-Americans as well as those with older housing, poor households were given the lowest grade of four, meaning hazardous or coded as red. Um, these areas experienced redlining. They did not receive, in many cases, were ineligible for FHA-backed mortgage loans or other financial options. 
And in some of my prior work, I was asking the question of whether residential redlining in the form of institutional racism was associated with pregnancy and birth. This was among a population of births in Philadelphia based on data in 2004 to 2008. And we found that redlining was associated with segregation, a slightly lower risk of preterm birth, but also associated with stress during pregnancy. We're continuing some of this work among a population-based sample um, throughout Pennsylvania. And many others have investigated the ways in which structural institutional racism, quote unquote, get under the skin and affect maternal and infant health such as the effects of police violence, the judicial system, generational wealth inequalities, and political representation. For example, I recently had the opportunity to moderate a talk with Dr. Rachel Hardiman, and her talk was called Black Babies Matter. And in this, she described some of her work around structural racism in healthcare, where um, she found that infant physician racial concordance was associated with improvement in mortality for black infants, so that's infant mortality, but no significant improvement around maternal mortality. Dr. Hardiman is also continuing and leading new work around the effects of structural racism in the form of police violence on infant and maternal health. We also know that daily experiences of gendered racism or oppression over the life course results in advanced aging, adverse health, including pregnancy, and known as weathering. Right, so some may know the concept of weathering, the wear and tear on the body over time and over the life course. I currently lead the PMOM study, the pregnancy um, mobile uh, mother study, the pregnancy cohort that includes follow up through one year postpartum, where um, birthing people um, share about their experiences of um, sexism and racism. And in one of our analyses in particular, we found that among our population of close to 300 birthing people, that Black birthing people reported an average of two experiences of racism per day, and that white birthing people reported an average of one experience of sexism a day. And these were general experiences that they were re re reporting, so not necessarily specific to medical care, although they could articulate whether or not those experiences happened within that space. And this is not the only study, right? There are many, many other studies that talk about the experiences of racism and self-reported experiences in association with adverse pregnancy and birth outcomes. Also within this context and specifically in Pittsburgh, once again, where I'm located, um, the mayor commissioned a report by the Pittsburgh Gender Equity Commission on Pittsburgh's inequality across gender and race. The report found that black women had worse outcomes in multiple areas ranging from health to economic opportunity compared to their white counterparts and that Pittsburgh in particular had disparities that were even worse compared to cities, similar, other similar cities. So in response to this report, a collective of black women, we wrote a letter to bring attention to the report's process, the content that lacked significant level of leadership from black women and femmes, did not reference the current historical impact of racism um, and gendered racism, but also centered the scholarship of white researchers and scholars in validating the experiences of those most affected, Black women and femmes. And in our response, we drew particular attention to the Black Mamas Matter Alliance report, Advancing Holistic Maternal Care for Black Women Through Policy. And in their one section, and, and we quote this in, in, in the response of identifying and ensuring the mechanisms for engagement and prioritization of Black women and Black women-led entities and policy, and program development and implementation. This included ensuring Black women are prioritized participants at every level of decision-making, investing in the time and expertise of Black women-led organizations, investing in financial resources, and applying an intersectional lens in policy development and implementation. One of the outgrowths of our collective work locally after that response was the Black Women and Femmes Project. Many of us have been working in reproductive justice, equity, maternal child health space for, for quite some time. Um, and this project in particular was to elevate our collective work, um, taking a reproductive justice lens, as well as an intersectional approach to addressing local inequities in health for Black women and femmes. Um, for those who don't know, reproductive justice was coined by Black women and femmes, and it is a human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy have children, not have children, and parent children in safe and sustainable communities. And so the focus of our project was to really interrogate the systems and institutions locally, right? Assessing whether those local systems 
institutions and organizations are attentive or not attentive to the health and well being of Black women and femmes, and then develop plans and actions for next steps. This is just a figure depicting some of the core areas that we are focusing on. This is an ongoing project, but asking the question of like, where is the money? Where are the resources going? What are the local organizations that are in the health space? What are they doing? And then finally, what are some of the policies? And we did focus on specific policy areas. And this was all with the, the overarching question of how is funding, organizational work, and policies attentive to the needs of Black women and femmes in the region? And if they are not, are they taking a racial equity lens in their work? Um, and once again, this is ongoing. And then just a, 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 some final points um, that I want to relay some, some um, just to summarize a bit of what I said, but then to add a few other um, key points, which is um, both reproductive justice and health across the lifespan are critical. When we think about maternal health, we are thinking about health prior to, during, and even out, outside of childbearing, right? That there is a life course and a lifespan that is really important um, that we um, take into account. Intersectionality and racism as a public health crisis are critical as well. That we continue to monitor how racism and other forms of oppression are showing up and strategize to combat it. Um, another point is demedicalizing birth and pregnancy as a natural event. And it is not to say that we don't have a way to go to really address the inequities in maternity care or healthcare in general, um, but really demedicalizing birth means that we are taking community-led approaches that are comprehensive, that are integrated, um, community-based doula work, which I know Representative Cephas will talk about in some of her legislation, um, and other approaches that are outside of the medical frame. And when we think about health in the long term, um, many, of our many of our health issues are impacted by a number of social and structural determinants. And so that's where health and all comes in, right? That our health is shaped by a number of things, not just healthcare, but housing and the environment, for example. And then finally, I'll end with policy because I know Repres Representative Cephas will talk more in detail but in our American Rescue Plan that was recently adopted, this includes expansion of Medicaid coverage at the state level from 60 days to 12 months postpartum. And we know in most states, 50% of births are um, uh, medic, um, under Medicaid. Um, what does this look like even outside of Medicaid, right? For those who may not be eligible for Medicaid and extending um, that care. The Black Maternal Momnibus um, legislation and a series of bills led by Representative um, Lauren Underwood. And then finally, um, as we'll hear from the illustrious Representative Cephas, a lot of her work around maternal health and related legislation in Pennsylvania. So I'll end there with just a, my contact information and I look forward to further discussion um, during the panel. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Mendez, for sharing. That was really, really powerful. I'm getting full. I know Representative Cephas has more for us. We'll be back with Dr. Mendez um, at the end. And if we have time, we'll throw some questions in there for her. But thank you once again. Um, now I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, State Representative Morgan Cephas, who represents Pennsylvania's 192nd District. She was elected to serve her first term in the Pennsylvania House in November 2016. A native of West Philadelphia and product of public school, Representative Cephas has worked tirelessly in the public sector, building her community block by block. At an early age, Representative Cephas realized that a community that offers safety, job security, access to quality education, and multi-generational recreational activities are key components to ensuring a neighborhood success. In the General Assembly, her priorities include increasing education opportunities and career pipelines for youth and young adults, creating jobs through business expansion, providing resources to seniors, expanding access to health care to improve health outcomes, and ensuring women and girls are a priority in the Assembly. Since joining the PA House, Representative Cephas has introduced laws to reverse the trend of maternal mortality. She recently said, it's alarming that Pennsylvania's maternal mortality rates have been rising and doing so disproportionately in communities of color. She is engaged in conversations with Pennsylvania Department of Health Acting Secretary, Allison Bean, 
about how the pandemic is affecting these numbers and how maternal health can be prioritized in COVID vaccine dis distribution. Representative Cephas currently sits on the Agricultural and Rural Affairs, Appropriations and Labor and Industry Committees. She also sits on the Committee of on Committees. She is the member, a member of the Pennsylvania Black Legislative Caucus and chairwoman of the and chairwoman of the Women and Girls of Color Subcommittee. She is also a member of the Philadelphia delegation and vice chairwoman of the Democratic Women's Health Caucus here in Pennsylvania. As a native of Philadelphia myself, it is my pleasure to introduce and to share this time with you. Representative Cephas, thank you so much and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Had to get my mute button together. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation today, especially during Black Maternal Health Week. Um, as was stated, I am State Representative Morgan Cephas, and I have the pleasure of representing the 192nd Legislative District, which uh, hails out in Western um, West Philadelphia, um, out in uh, Philadelphia County. And as was mentioned, I am actively serving my third term, and I've recently been elevated from Vice Chair of the Women's Health Caucus to uh, Co-Chair of the Women's Health Caucus. And later in my presentation, I'll talk to you about um, some of the top priorities we have for this legislative session. Um, a lot of it relates to um, the entirety of an individual prior to, well, during the birthing experience, but also before and after. And, uh, you know, that's really where we've seen, as the, the doctor pointed out, just so much uh, great information. I'm literally like taking notes the entire time. Um, but as she mentioned, um, it's critical as we're having a and putting this focal point on Black maternal health, that we're not just focusing on an individual during the birthing process, because there's so much more that happens before and after that contributes to that individual's outcomes. So, you know, similar to the doctor, I'll be highlighting um, a significant number of data points related to uh, maternal health, as well as, you know, maternal mortality, but also talking about the social determinants of health and how pub public policy from a local, state, and federal level have to work on addressing those social determinants of health, but also looking at um, policy and funding strategies with a racial equitable lens if we really want to tackle the uh, poor health outcomes as it relates to Black birthing people here, not just in the Commonwealth, but across the country. So with that, I am going to share my slides. Fantastic. So again, I, uh, as I'm serving my third term in the Pennsylvania General Assembly, I have um, decided to take up the efforts around uh, maternal health, but specifically as it relates to Black maternal health. And, uh, you know, just to lay some foundation, um, how I've gotten here as an elected official, you know, you come into office, you know, trail, trails blazing, you know, thinking that you are going to, you know, conquer the world, upset those tables that we're pulling our folding chair up to. But little did I know, walking into a general assembly where there are only 10 African American American women legislator, legislators, you realize quickly that you are in the minority and oftentimes the issues that you're championing that are coming directly from black and brown communities that you're representing are often uh, on the menu um, rather than, you know, on the table to, you know, move in a significant way. And, you know, what really brought me to this issue is I had an opportunity to participate in a roundtable discussion with uh, Senator Bob Casey at the time here in Philadelphia um, and across the nation, there was a big conversation about how black bodies, uh, particularly black women were constantly used to 
um, deliver election cycles. Um, but after that uh, particular politician got elected, our issues and you know the concerns that we are most you know focused on oftentimes got left by the wayside, and uh, you you didn't necessarily see any follow ups or any outcomes as a result of us getting to the polls and changing. We literally changed the direction of this country, and uh, you know during the conversation we had um, a young woman, and this is a conversation in Philadelphia with a, a series of prominent women across different uh, platforms and industries that came together to really talk to the senator about our priority issues and what we like to see, not just on the federal, but the state level as well. And during that conversation, uh, a young woman asked, what was Pennsylvania doing about the maternal mortality rate that's, um, that's existing and trending in the wrong direction? And, you know, as the doctor mentioned, you know, so many different data points showing uh, our country, um, you know, really lagging behind on moving the needle uh, on this issue. And unfortunately, at the time, I always like to tell this story because as elected officials, if we're not being honest and we can't, you know, really get to the crux of issues and actually move policy, but at the time, I had known nothing about the issue. Um, again, as a legislator, as a legislator with you know all that we are dealing with, especially as black legislators, um, it just wasn't an issue that had come across my desk. But luckily the woman talked about the Serena Williams expose. Um, so I immediately took a chance to watch it. They mentioned the Times um, articles and it, it really had been elevated and had become a part of so many election conversations, uh, particularly presidential conversations. And you know, as a result, I you know looked to see who was really taking up this issue in Harrisburg. And unfortunately, at that time, there wasn't a lot being done around the issue. Um, and during that time, as I was taking that deeper dive, I was, you know, connecting to organizations like Oshun Family Center, Healthy Start in Pittsburgh, as well as New Voices for Reproductive Justice, who have all held my hand um, and helped me to understand the, you know, the dynamics and how deep this issue of maternal health outcomes goes. Um, and during that time, as I was um, having this conversation, I had a young person, she was 34 years old, Lashana Gilmore, I'll never forget her name. She lost her life. Um, she was 34 at the time. I literally was 35 at the time. She had lost her life um, during her pregnancy in a nearby hospital. And she um, came from my district and, uh, you know, lived an extremely healthy life, extremely active, well-educated, you know, not, you know, wanting for, for anything. And, you know, I realized as one of the leading policymakers in the city of Philadelphia asked me, you know, why are Black women dying? Is it because of their economics? Is it because of their, um, their low education attainment? And I literally had to use the Serena Williams example um, to really point to that, no, there's something larger and more deeper in our healthcare system, but also our lives in general outside of the hospital that's really contributing to the poor outcomes. So I say all that to say um, that Black Maternal Health Week, I'm beyond excited to you know, be having conversations as to what are we doing public policy wise, but then also listening to so many awesome presentations um, that are contributing to you know, these policy recommendations. Uh, one thing I firmly believe is that if it's not measured, it's not managed. And for some time, we did not have uh, the data to, you know, really articulate what the problem was, but then also to be able to disaggregate aggregate that data to explain when are the, when are the deaths happening? Why are you know black and brown women disproportionately impacted to this by this issue? Uh, what are the other social determinants of health? How is racism playing a, a prominent role in um, the poor outcomes? So you know, happy to say that you know Black Maternal Health Week has really had a big week this week um, between President Joe Biden. Um, the, offering a proclamation, um, acknowledging the actual week, but also tasking um, Vice President Kamala Harris, who had been a champion uh, long before this, as well as um, Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, um, have been champions while they were serving in the Senate and as uh, Congresswoman Underwood serves in the House, long been a champion of these issues and, you know, went into a new seat at a different table, you know, with gun bl guns blazing and, you know, 
well understanding uh, the challenges in the space and what recommendations need to move forward as a result of these outcomes. But then also to have Susan Rice, who is currently the director yeah. of US uh, Domestic Policy Council, and she's charged with ensuring a racial, a racial equity lens is used as we're developing policies and funding recommendations across all departments in the federal government, but specifically when it comes to Black Maternal Health Week, um, moving policies as it relates to this issue. And last but not least, to see uh, Governor Tom Wolf, um, as well as the Pennsylvania Women's Commission, take up uh, this challenge as well, as well as the Department of Health, um, the Department of Health actually, um, who just in the Department of Human Services, I mean, as well as the Department of Health, who have just recently um, adopted the idea of ensuring that a racial equity lens is put forward as they're developing their policies. Um, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, I spent my entire uh, session this year focusing on racial equity as it relates to health outcomes. So I say all that to say um, that we, uh, from a policy perspective, are in a really good place. And you know, one of the things that was you know, really exciting, and again, I'm gonna keep representing the doctor because so much stuff that I'm going to talk about, she's you know, eloquently covered um, with you know, data points and background research. But one of the most exciting things about um, being in this maternal health space right now is that we are thinking more broader than just an individual um, going through their birthing process. So we're, you know, not just talking about um, the challenges that uh, black uh, and black people, black birthing people, are experiencing when you know they're looking to act as uh, prenatal support. Uh, we're not just talking about you know the limit limitations around reliable transportation, childcare, economic the economic pressures that come with having to uh, take off of work or you know redo your schedule in order to access those prenatal appointments. Um, again, our our conversation has been during the birthing process, and you know just realizing what some of those challenges are. But as you move through, as individuals are moving through um, their birthing experience, you know, addressing issues around preeclampsia and cardiovascular challenges, as well as severe bleeding. I mean, there's so much that has been done during this immediate time period when an individual is pregnant and giving birth. There's this analogy, um, and I always get it wrong. It's um, it, it's an analogy about a piece of candy and you know having a wrapper around this piece of candy during the birthing process. Process, you know, there's this constant focus on the mother, which represents, you know, that wrapper around that candy. But once, you know, that baby is born, or once the, or prior to the baby being born, there is no attention uh, focused on, you know, this birthing person. So when we're not looking at what's happening pre-pregnancy or after that year postpartum, uh, we're not really touching on the the entire spectrum of an individual. Um, bringing a, a, a child into, into this world. And when we're not doing that, that really contributes to our poor health outcomes. So when we're talking about, we can't just talk about racism as it relates to the healthcare system. We have to talk about racism as it relates to every other system that this individual is interacting with. So when we're talking about, you know, individual, you know, prior to them even making the decision about becoming pregnant, it's, you know, looking at the issues of their economic situation. Like, so when we're talking about policies related to pay equity, when we're talking about issues related to, you know, increasing the minimum wage, when we're talking about family medical leave and things of that nature, these are all additional pressures that go on to a person. This is again, prior to them even making the decision. And when we're talking about, you know, the environmental impact where this individual is, when we talk about police brutality, the added stress that that adds, we're really talking about the social determinants of health that, you know, are, you know, go around this individual as they're making the decision, as they're going through the birthing process, and after that year postpartum. And that's really what our policy perspective has to focus on. And that's one thing that I immediately learned. And luckily, there are more experts in this space, you know, that have, you know, educated me about this, is that we cannot just, we have to focus during the birthing period, but we also have to ensure that this individual and their families are supported, you know, throughout this entire process 
us and that the systems that they interact with each day, that we are addressing those underlining inequities and disparities as well as the racism that are touching every aspect of their life because all of those things will contribute to an individual's health outcomes. And that leads me to just, you know, talking about, again, the social determinants of health. And, you know, one of the things that we, you know, realize that um, access to healthcare facilities, again, is not the only determinant as it relates to the health outcome and health equity of an individual. Um, you know, I found this really cool graphic that, you know, breaks down the other areas and aspects of an individual's life that contribute to those outcomes. So when we're talking about, again, the social economic factors and the fact that it's, you know, 40% of, you know, their health outcomes, it's, you know, the decisions that they are able to make. So when we're talking about um, a fair funding formula and the inability to um, have a quality education system in their backyard or educational pathways and the limited access, that, that contributes to an individual's, you know, ability to have um, a higher wage or, you know, a higher level of income. And when we're talking about uh, again, the issue of pay equity and family leave and job security, reliable childcare, it really, you know, it really contributes to an individual's uh, decision, healthcare decisions, essentially, whether or not they can afford the multiple, um, the multiple perinatal uh uh, the prenatal appointments that they're making, whether or not they can afford to even just travel to those appointments or uh, their ability to take off work, you know, all of those things come into play when it comes to their health out health outcomes. Again, find fiscal, uh, physical environment. I mean, we're, I know out in Western PA, um, there is a significant level of fracking out in that area and rather, you know, wherever you are on the issue, uh, fracking inevitably has an environmental impact. So an individual um, dealing with those challenges, those healthcare challenges that are impacting their day-to-day -day lives here in Philadelphia as, I mean, we scream at the top of our lungs about lead and asbestos. We're an extremely old city, similar to out in Western PA, a uh, formerly industrialized city, which has led, left an, a significant environmental impact, not just to our school buildings, which you'll hear a lot of, a lot about, but it has left a significant impact to um, our, our ground and our drinking water, our, 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 our homes that, you know, majority of them have been built prior to 1970. So those physical environment, environmental challenges, you know, play a role in those outcomes. And again, I go back to the issue of not just police brutality, but also the gun violence that we're experiencing here in the city of Philadelphia. Um, the threat of, you know, not knowing whether or not you're going to, you know, be able to come home at night safely or an individual that you love is able to come home safely or not, that plays a role in your health outcomes because of the stress that it adds to your day-to-day -day life. And, you know, last but not least, it's always health behavior. Um, but, you know, when I talk about health behavior, some of those decisions, you know, have been made outside of outside of our own everyday decisions. So, you know, I, I participated in a conversation earlier today, earlier this week, and one of the presenters talked about um, being a, uh, a urban developer and understanding the history um, of urban development and, you know, the development of cities and, you know, the issue of redlining and the challenges that that has created, as well as the issues um, that happened in New York where they're built, where they built, you know, highways and expressways to divide communities. And, you know, when you think about the lack of investment in uh, certain communities plays a significant role. And, you know, again, the pressures and the, the health outcomes of an individual. So I raise all this uh, because that really has uh, driven our policy perspective in Harrisburg. And I'm not going to say everybody's policy perspective. Um, and I say that because We've literally, I sit on the uh, health committee as well as the insurance committee. And given all that is happening during COVID-19, our, our very first health committee meeting was in reference to limiting the access to abortion. And uh, as Democrats, we're like dumbfounded because we're like, after everything that is happening in this climate as we speak, I mean, I'm talking about women being diagnosed with COVID-19 at a, at a higher rate, women passing away at a higher rate of 
due to COVID-19. And, you know, it has a direct correlation because women are breadwinners, mm -hmm. are the household breadwinners. They are our frontline workers. And the fact that we're not creating, um, we're not talking about creating more of a healthcare system that, you know, creates better equity as it relates to not just race, but gender is, is astonishing mm -hmm. that our first hearing again is about limiting abortion access. Mind you, in other states, and I know the doctor sits on the Maternal Mortality Review Committee, I was, uh, we were listening to um, one of the members of that committee who mentioned that in other states, when there has been a trend and a direct correlation, when you're limiting um, access to abortion care, it correlates with higher rates of maternal mortality. Now, that, that hasn't been a correlation here in Pennsylvania yet, only because the report for maternal deaths have just recently come out, but in other states, um, that there has been a correlation. So, you know, I say all that to say that you know the Women's Health Caucus. Um, I again in a co am a co chair with uh, State Representative Mary Jo Daly, Senator Amanda Capaletti, as well as Senator Judy Swank. We've really laid out an aggressive agenda that you know not just looks at that time period where an individual is pregnant, giving birth, and up to the year postpartum, but again those you know outside periods of that time frame that really contribute to the health outcomes of an individual. So again, those social determinants of health. So some of the areas that we are focusing on, again, is maternal health and child care, maternal mortality naturally, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, after this slide, but also maternal health care, the expanding the actual workforce, the perinatal workforce is key to ensuring uh, there are equitable access points and, you know, the opportunity for families and birthing people to make their own decisions as to where they want to give birth and you know who they want assisting them you know bringing an individual into this world but then also post postpartum coverage as well as affordable uh, child care. The other area of focus is workplace and economic justice, uh, workplace accommodations. My colleague Mary Jo Daly is a, a big proponent of this. Is that you know as an individual? I mean, I'm sure you've heard the statistics. Uh, close to 2.2 million. This comes from the National Women's Law Project. Close to 2.2 million women have left the workplace due to uh, pressures during COVID-19. So, you know, ensuring that there are workplace uh, accommodations for um, birthing people that are coming back into work to ensure that they are that they have equitable access to you know live a uh, equitable life but then also sexual harassment and discrimination is you know i know it's not the the top issue um today but you know if you rewind two years ago there was significant work done in this area and last but not least again equal pay fair wages and pay leave because again you know as we're talking about equal pay, when we talk about equal pay day, we that's not even equitable. We're talking about, you know, white women that make, you know, that 80 cents on a dollar, whereas black women don't catch up and they're at the 50 cents. And then if you think of, you know, Hispanic women, women, it goes, you know, down even further. Um, so it's it's critical to really pay attention to that issue because again, it lends to those health outcomes and those financial decisions you have to make um, as it relates to your maternal health. Uh, dignity for incarcerated women has been uh, a big issue of mine because we have to pay attention between the intersection of you know being a being a woman or a, a femme identifying person as well as you know being incarcerated and. You know, we have a number of individuals that are incarcerated that are pregnant and, you know, what are we doing to ensure their, uh, their dignity and, you know, their safety as well. So some of the things, again, is, you know, access to feminine hygiene products, as, you know, you've heard uh, nationally has been an issue. Now, it, they do offer it currently in Pennsylvania for free, but they, um, but that is only policy. It's not, uh, it's not in statute. Um, People, there are areas where uh, shackling still occurs, so strengthening those laws, shackling for pregnant and postpartum individuals, and ensuring trauma informed training for uh, staff as well. Last but not least, you know, we center around healthcare, expanded reproductive healthcare access and coverage. Again, um, we went from uh, 145 abortion clinics down to 17 clinics. Um, uh, over the past uh, two or three decades. And again, that's limiting access. Uh, additionally, um, dealing with clinical practice, patient autonomy, menstrual equity, and access to, to telehealth is gonna be critical. 
um, not just, you know, as it relates to, you know, COVID-19, but how can, you know, we deliver medicine in an equitable way through telehealth, but also how do we, how do we finance this type of new technology that we've been forced into? So like the University of Penn um, has invested in a new, uh, new uh, technology and platform that helps monitor individuals that are that are, you know, leaving the hospital, uh, having just recently given birth, but also uh, watching their their signs and their vitals, and you know, keeping up with them through technology, through an app, and you know, it's how do we how do we as legislators, you know, invest in that type of innovation, but then also ensure that they are being reimbursed equitably, equitably um, through insurance. So here are some of the bills that um, we have uh, that we have introduced. Um, of course, Medicaid extension to a year postpartum, um, Medicaid reimbursements for doula services, and this really gets at uh, expanding the perinatal workforce. Um, there is a bill sponsored by a Republican currently to um, license certified midwives. Um, that's moving along, and there's also um, I've introduced a bill around. Um, certifying and licensing doulas, as well as ensuring uh, equitable Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, there's also a conversation around implicit bias and cultural competency uh, for continued education for medical and health professionals that I've introduced. Um, several of my colleagues um, on both sides have introduced leg legislation around expanding postpartum screening and support. Um, as the doctor mentioned, um, over 50%, uh, not over 50%, but um, uh, what is it, uh, during the postpartum period, that's where we lose the majority of birthing people. 51% uh, of the deaths, uh, maternal mortality deaths happen during the postpartum period, which is why you see a lot of um, efforts around this space. Uh, another series of my colleagues are focusing on uh, requiring insurance to cover fertility treatments and increasing contraceptive access. Uh, last but not least, there are several bills around um, different type of leaves, paternal uh, involvement leave or um, parent leave and things of that nature. But and last but not least, there's been close to 15 to 20 bills uh, introduced regarding dignity for incarcerated pregnant and postpartum women. One of the areas that, again, that I have focused on is the issue of maternal mortality, uh, which is where a significant of um, number of my bills have uh, come from, from this issue. And again, the doctor has um, really illustrated, you know, all of the data points that you could have wanted around uh, this topic. But again, I'll just reiterate that nationwide, um, we have uh, we have the worst maternal mortality rates um, than any other developed nation. Um, as as the doctor mentioned before, fifty one percent of the deaths that occur, according to the CDC, are during the postpartum period. Thirty one percent during pregnancy and sixteen percent day of delivery. And recently, both Pennsylvania, who has a maternal mortality review committee, just released a report. And, you know, as the doctor said, our numbers are trending in the wrong direction. Um, and the study was done between 2013 and 2018. And we've seen a 21% increase in maternal mortality deaths. And as you can imagine, uh, well, as we've constantly stated through, throughout this presentation, Black women are three times more likely to die. And they represented 23% of the deaths, but only 14% of the births. Um, so that should show you uh, where we are as a commonwealth in comparison to the nation. But also the city of Philadelphia has recently released a report as well. We were one of the first cities in 2010 to establish a maternal mortality review committee specifically focusing on the deaths that have occurred in Philadelphia. And our, we are trending in a similar direction um, where uh, we don't have, um, we, we haven't, you know, gotten our, we haven't wrapped our arms around, uh, not the why, but, you know, changing the trajectory of um, those statistics. So we are having similar challenges, but again, the great thing about having a review committee that is disaggregating and honing in on our particular challenges here in Philadelphia will make all the difference when we're making rec recommendations. And the call to action, um, is just reflected in uh, the bills and things that we have introduced that have been talked throughout uh, this week. 
last but not least is just, you know, some of the work that's happening here in Pennsylvania. And I'll, uh, I'll close out where I begin. Um, there is a significant focus on Black Maternal Health Week which, and just Black Maternal Health, which is, you know, just we're in an exciting time. And, you know, I always am a firm believer for every crisis, although we hate it and it's difficult to see the light at the end of the tunnel, we, we desperately need to use this as an opportunity to advance all of the work that, again, organizations like this organizations like Oshun and New Voices for Reproductive Health, um, all of the work that they've been doing for decades, you know, we haven't, I believe, um, and elected officials were forced to see the glass half full. I truly believe with all of the money that's coming in from the federal government with the champ, with Kamala Harris, Harris being a champion of black maternal health in Washington, DC, we really have a moment in time to move the needle on so many, so many of these things. So some of the things that have recently taken place is uh, Pennsylvania, we received $2.5 million from the CDC in grant funding for our review committee. Uh, Philadelphia's uh, review committee received a million dollar grant from um, the Merck uh, for Mothers Foundation, as well as we're seeing funding coming down from the American Rescue Plan that the doctor talked about. And there was a recent announcement that there will be $200 million dedicated um, in this upcoming federal budget for maternal mortality review committees. Now moving over to the policy focus, one of the things, as you can imagine, is extremely difficult, and this is one of the, the questions I get all the time, is uh, what's the likelihood of your bills moving? And unfortunately, as a Democrat in Harrisburg, the, it's not likely. Um, but the good thing is that we had a Republican, and I always mention his name, Ryan McKenzie. He is the one that ushered legislation to establish a review committee um, here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I think we are, you know, one of the 38 states that now have a review committee. And as a result, I mean, he has um, taken a particular interest in this issue and was looking to the report to make a series of recommendations um, that uh, we can either legislatively move forward or from a fiscal perspective, move forward as well. Um, and also the great thing about having a, a democratic governor, they actually can make policy decisions without the need to uh, usher legislation. So some of the things that are on the horizon, as the doctor mentioned with the American Rescue Plan, there is an option for states to amend their state plans to extend uh, Medicaid up to a year postpartum for uh, five years. And that is something that the administration has said that they intended to do. And now myself and my Republican colleague, uh, again, Ryan McKenzie, we are working with the administration on what that number looks like to get that in this year's budget. So that is a, a big win for the maternal, uh, Black maternal health space. Additionally, um, we, there's been a constant, you know, several bills introduced again in reference to expanding the perinatal uh, health workforce. My particular interest has been on uh, doulas and um, as a part of the administration's um, amendment to their uh, state plan, they will be looking to uh, include doulas in that amendment. And currently right now, the Jewish um, Health Federation right now, Health Federation right now is um, coordinating a doula conversation over the next couple of months to uh, see what that looks like uh, by way of certification as well as reimbursements. And uh, last but not least, of course, uh, requiring implicit bias training for continuing education credits. I just recently had a conversation with the chair of the uh, Board of Medicine here in Pennsylvania, and this is something that they're looking at. Um, so the on the good news is that there has been significant focus, you know, on this issue. And again, I do truly believe this is a moment in time that um, these advocacy groups that have been champ championing this issue for some time to really move the needle on some of the policy work um, that they've been working on for decades. Um, last but not least, now since you know everything's been touched on under the Biden Harris administration, um, just recently, if I mean this week, there um, so states were requesting uh, state waivers to do the Medicaid expansion, but and none have been approved even since uh, Barack Obama's administration, but Illinois just recently was approved this week. So again, it's a, a turn in the right direction for um, 
maternal health in general, but really to you know ensure that we're moving policy in order to move along these uh, poor health outcomes that we're experiencing. Um, so with that, that is what we are doing uh, here in the Commonwealth. And again, I, I thank you for allowing me to be a part of this conversation today. And you know, I look forward to the panel discussion and you know, questions from the audience. Wow, wow, that was amazing. Um, I was over here sitting almost in tears to be able to have both of you on to just articulate the challenges and the areas of opportunity for, you know, for the United States, but then also for our region and our state. So thank you so much as a woman who is preparing and planning to soon have, you know, get pregnant. I'm like, wow, the, these are all the conversations I'm having in secret. So, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, audience, we have gone over, but I do not wanna miss this opportunity to at least ask one question and I'll pose it to both of you. Um, the question is how can expected mothers advocate for their care? Dr. Dara Mendez, I want you to look at this on a community level, if you can address this on a personal level and then Representative Cephas, if you can take us at a little bit higher level at the policy level, um, at the, you know, the city level, Level, what can we do federally, whatever it is, what can expecting mothers do to really let their voice be heard? Absolutely. Thank you for that question and the person who posed it. Um, I think it's really critical and important when we think about advocacy on multiple levels. And when I think about advocacy, I also think about accountability, right? Systems being accountable to us, right? So, it, you know, Representative Cephas talked about the myriad of ways in which the structures and institutions are built for things to be difficult, right? Built for us to have limited access, built in ways that make it difficult to, to navigate and get the things that are necessary, not just during the pregnancy period, but as we talked about along the life course, right? Before and after. Um, so I think there are a number of things that um, are happening and, and being discussed as it relates to advocacy on the individual level. Um, you know, many are talking about the ways in which one would, um, if they were to experience a traumatic um, event or um, mistreatment um, in a healthcare setting, for example, what are the ways to report that? What are the accountability measures to make sure that that reporting is followed through? And you can imagine the difficulty of doing that. One, because you're in the, the middle or crux of that experience and do you have you know, the tools or the ability, is there even a reporting system for that? And then two, it's not of the advantage for that system to really be reflective in that way, right? So um, there is some national work being done, local and national work around uh, respectful maternity care. I wanna lift up the National Birth Equity um, Collaborative that's been doing quite a bit of that work. Um, there are a number of um, folks locally who have also been talking about ways in which we can be accountable, right? And when we think about advocacy on the sort of community level, you know, when we think about birthing and pregnancy and sort of that period, that it, as we talked about, goes and extends beyond that individual. And so what are the other um, both tools as well as resources available to that individual around advocacy? Um, Dr. Or Morgan Cephas talked about, Representative Cephas talked about community-based doulas as one avenue in which we know doulas have been supportive um, throughout pregnancy and even postpartum. Um, and we can even think about health doulas, right? Doulas who help people navigate the health system even outside of pregnancy. <clears throat> and so that is also another form of advocacy um, and support during that time as well. Um, but once again, it's begging this question of putting the onus on the individual, right? When we know there's so many systems that are not um, you know, doing what they can to, to ensure that there is a, um, a healthy outcome, not just in the context of pregnancy, but beyond. I think um, from my lens uh, as an elected, making the space for the black and brown experts that are in the field. Um, one of the things that you know I quickly realized with even just understanding the difference between a doula and a midwife, or um, the different types of midwives, and you know me just having to articulate that you know not being in the health arena as long as you know so many of you, I realized you know well let me get out of the way and just be the access point 
for these individuals to be at the table. So that's why, you know, constantly, if I'm having meetings in, you know, with secretaries or with departments, I'm not just bringing my staff, but I, I'm bringing the experts with me to, you know, things that I might not be able to articulate or, you know, they might be wrapping, you know, just words around me that is just not my expertise. So I think, you know, one way that I've been, I've worked on allowing advocates and voices to be at the table is just by getting out of the way as an elected official and just being that access point. Um, so I've, uh, requested and have hosted a series of um, policy hearings um, you know throughout the throughout the Commonwealth with our uh, policy our Democratic Policy Committee as well as our women's health caucus um, and you know during those policy hearings not just having you know the doctors there but actually having those with lived experiences so our colleagues can hear the experiences of you know women that are just as educated that you know are making just as mu much money that are living in you know, well off communities. So they're not just painting this as, you know, a poor woman's problem or an individual that just made poor decisions or a black woman's problem, but, you know, just a problem as it relates to women and femme identifying people and, you know, ensuring that they have a place at the table to tell their own lived experiences, but then also ensuring that, um, you know, as a chair of the Women's Health Caucus, making sure that black and brown women are even at that table when it comes to, you know, advocacy groups and being able to, you know, share what's happening on the ground from their lens and from their perspective. Um, so I think those are, you know, really some of the ways that, um, you know, pregnant people can, you know, advocate for themselves is, you know, telling that story. And I, I am a firm believer now just entering in this space, literally my younger sister, um, she gave birth during COVID-19. I immediately told her, you have to get a doula because you can't, you know, love my mother to death. But the last time she had a baby was 30 years ago. And this is like a completely different world. So, you know, she was able to get a doula and she was also considering having, you know, an out of hospital birth and, you know, just going through with her, her experiences in the hospital, mind you, she has her MBA and she has her own consulting firm. It was as if, you know, she was just this un I mean, it was just as if she just was this disadvantaged person that, you know, didn't know or understand, you know, her body or why she made those decisions. She just was faced with so many different stigmas. It was just eye opening. Um, but, you know, again, what really helped her was connecting with a doula, connecting with a midwife to explain, you know, the process of what's going to happen and where you need to advocate for yourself. So, you know, I think those are some of the ways that, you know, people that are interested in getting pregnant or those that are currently uh, pregnant really should tap into, you know, experts like uh, doulas and midwives in order to coach them through the experience, but also don't be afraid to, you know, tell your legislator your story and what's happening and asking them specifically, what are you doing about it? Wow, wow, thank you so much. Just even thinking about individuals in my life, one of my best friends having those same challenges um, and, and going through the process of being treated as if you know she was less than, than nothing and um, now is in a position of having to figure out what to do her reproductive whole status is in crisis and she's you know well educated but yet when she walked into the hospital she was a black woman <laughs> so uh, i'm just thank you so much to the both of you for sharing thank you for giving your time i'm seeing people in the chat just saying that they feel inspired they feel hopeful and i know it's the same thing for me i really do feel hopeful that they um, before, just for the audience, before you got on, we were saying, you know, we're doing this together and we're pushing forward and this is this is our time. It seems like we're making headway. So thank you again, Representative Cephas. Thank you, Dr. Mendez, for all that you do for Black maternal health, for Black women, for Black, black and brown babies. We really do appreciate you both. Um, and with that audience, I want to say that sadly that we've come to the end. I wish we could stay here all day. I know I really could and just talk about this. I wish I had some tea and we could just relax and keep going. But we do have to wrap this up at this moment. As I said, I want to thank um, Dr. Mendez and Representative Cephas for giving their time and their energy. I also want to thank our generous sponsors for their support of the Better Health Outcomes Speaker Series, Highmark Foundation, PNC, the Henry L. Hillman Foundation, Federal Loan Bank, Dollar Bank, and the Pittsburgh Business Group on Health. I also want to thank you.
you, our audience, everyone that joined us on Zoom, on Facebook. We saw you there. We saw you commenting. We saw you saying that you are a part of this and that your voice is a part of this. So we appreciate you as well. Um, last thing I want to mention is that our next edition of Better Health Outcome Speaker Series will take place on Thursday, July 29th at noon, mark it down, with a great lineup of speakers on behavioral health and vulnerable populations. To everyone that was with us today, we say thank you again, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.